All right. Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracol here, or Adams Van Sale, here to shine a light not on the, the real world this time, but on the virtual world. And uh, here to join me here tonight for this topic are the gents from the D Digital Archipelago podcast, the podcast name that also inspired the title of tonight's episode, because I think it's pretty apt for the topic. And uh, those two people are, and I think you might recognize them from previous episodes, seeing as both of them have been guests on the show. I've also featured on their channels, uh, The Prudentialist and Geo. Welcome on the show and welcome uh, everyone else in the chat as well. Well, thanks for having us on. It's always a pleasure to talk with you again. Mm. Oh, yeah. All right. So the, the topic for tonight is not... Uh, it's not a very focused specific one. It's actually much broader, but I wanted to chat to you gents about it because this is one of the things that I think uh, animates your podcast as well as discussing things that are going on on the interwebs, on the internet, what's going on on online spaces. And I think because of this uh, type of coverage that you do on your podcast and you actually go into specifically not just covering like a drama alert type show, but you also discuss what's going on in the background and analyze what you're seeing in this uh, online phenomena. So I wanted to chat to you about specifically the Internet's uh, impact on quite a few things. So the one is the in uh, Internet's impact on culture, then on art, then also on politics, news and human behavior and the overarching theme would be the internet's impact on reality. But before we get into that, uh, I think let's just start off with a simple question of if you uh, look at, if you use your your mind's eye and look into the future, what do you think when people look back at the internet's uh, impact on reality and human behavior and society from what we've seen now, do you think it would be considered overall positive or overall negative in regards to what it has been achieved and what do you think the, the, the whether the impact has been uh, in general positive or negative? We can start with uh, with UGO and then we move on to a Prudentialist. I usually, um, I like I like to see, uh, well, I like to say I let Prude talk first so I could riff, <laughs> but then, you know, sometimes I just have a rant like, uh, Currently, I'm all worked up because I saw this tweet by uh, our good our good friend Zero HP Lovecraft about the new Spider-Man movie, and uh, it got me thinking about my my book I'm currently writing about neoliberal kitsch. But anyways, about the positive influence of the internet, I think that it's it's a, it is an interesting question, but at the same time, I think if you examine the various like forces of technics in human society that have gone into creating the internet. I think that eventually um, a stream of mass communicate, like a, a sort of an apparatus of mass communication that can create a sort of planetary awareness. That was inevitability. Um, you could even say that uh, I, I remember, let me go into a little bit of history. I remember this was years and years ago. One of the first uh, face streams I was ever on was with Justin Murphy our good friend, Justin Murphy, J Murph. Um, and we were talking about how in some ways uh, the internet is, is as much a desiring machine as is a, a spiritual machine, if you will, as crazy and out there as it sounds. I know people are so, people are so uh, fed up of schizo posting, you know, last week of the UFO thing, me and Prude covered, but no, I think that the internet, it's not that it's a, a good or bad, but it's a reality that in some ways was going to come into being either way. And so therefore you have to prepare yourself. But in terms of just the actual question, I think that overall, um, if it was me of a few years ago, if it was, was like, you know, the, the depths of pine tree Twitter, I would say that of course, you know, it's funny because this week's digital capella is going to be about, you know, God rest his soul, Ted Kaczynski. Uh, but I, I think that it would say it was a negative and certainly it has, a ton of negative aspects but i do think that overall in terms of um the fulfillment of humanity on sort of a higher uh more vitalistic scale i think that inevitably it will be a good in some way it's just a matter of wrestling the internet from uh various nefarious forces that wish to corral it and um of course have corralled all of us into a number of uh distinct yet very infinitesimally small platforms as opposed to what the internet was back in the day, a sort of like ocean archipelago of a million different islands uh, where there was creative potential and, and so forth. Nowadays, of course, everything is a social media template. And of course, every social media site has to be the same um, because in, in the way that 
the functionality of it addicts, you know, there's an addictive quality to it. Recently, I've been watching YouTube shorts because, of course, I've been putting out more shorts. I mean, that's, I guess YouTube is, you know, TikTok works. So therefore, YouTube has to be TikTok now. So it's like, that's the way it works. It's sort of like the weirdo uh, instrumental reason aspect of it. But inevitably, yeah, I think it's overall been a positive experience. I mean, for the elite few, though, I would qualify that for the elite few, such as ourselves, uh, you know, and such as the audience watching this, not for the average pro, the average multitude has been psychologically and spiritually decimated by the internet. But, you know, for the elite aristocratic few, I think it's pretty much a good thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, when you mentioned how every website just becomes the same, I think the best embodiment of that is every social media website has to have stories or like short form content oh, yeah. that you just uh, post on the fly and then people can get up almost like a status update in a video form. Uh, before we get to you, Prudentialist, uh, Kony Current Year says, uh, I want Geo to open up a global village coffee house that caters exclusively to millennial nostalgia. You could have a bunch of South African expats going there, pretending they're still living in peak rain Buddhism. that's a oh yeah that's an interesting idea seeing as it's a it's the overlap between the time uh, well the time that uh, we all experienced as either late or early gen z or very very late uh, millennial and that is the uh, that millennial nostalgia of uh, the 90s and early oh, 2000 yeah. for south africa because at that time we were still before the internet south africa was still operating on a little bit of a culture lag so the influence from abroad culturally was not as quick and as instantaneous so your 90s kind of overlap into into our early 2000s but that's what he's referencing there is that peak rainbowism when uh, south nothing can go wrong in south africa it's like the world is our oyster we're going to be the next juggernaut uh, every economic growth is high unemployment's going down crime's going down everything is just perfect like nothing can stop us and uh, yeah, Africa I've, I've, playing in the background <laughs> <laughs> we yeah we uh yeah that's the that's the time that south africans grew up in when you talk about millennial uh nostalgia as well but yeah let's uh let's hand the mic over to you prude when you look at the internet's influence and what uh geo has referenced now do you think there's a an over overall positive effect in regards that it's bringing people together and uh, enabling organization in real life, or do you think it's the a lot more negative in regards to specifically escapism and trapping people online and actually keeping them away from having a real world impact? Uh, well, I would have to echo a lot of what Gio had said. I think that for a certain number, probably on like an 80-20 scale, right? 80% of the people totally just their mind has been completely rewired neurologically speaking i mean earlier today uh sort of just checking up on people like you do when you're on your phone or whatever someone had shared a video of this gentleman on on tiktok where he's giving this discussion and there are two things playing simultaneously it's himself talking and then right next to him is a video of some carpet cleaning service that's getting all this like years of grime and mud out of a carpet and he says, you know, if I could go back in time and uninstall TikTok, you know, like right the day I was going to do it, I'd, I'd slap my phone out of my hand and tell him to go outside because I don't think anymore. I have no thoughts. I just commit actions. I just scroll on to the next video. And I find that to be an absolutely terrifying presence. And I mean, you and I have talked about this before uh, where you had told me this was like a year and a half ago about you were down in some city walking and you heard someone that looks like you was born in this country of South Africa, but speaking perfect Americanized internet English. And I, right. I think of Kierkegaard's The Leveling, where everything is sort of homogenized and leveled down to where everyone just kind of knows this, you know, um, most common, lowest common denominator internet culture and that everyone can sort of interact with it. On the one hand, for like the 20% of people that have benefited from it, like, the ability to communicate ideas and to find like-minded individuals and to coordinate with them on certain political actions is great. But at the same time, you know, it, it becomes very easy for people to self-regulate their own fandoms and basic assumption groups to where, you know, there's a certain, you know, forum that people will associate with there. That's their forum, right? Like there's, a, there's the Armar Knights. They're in this little corner <laughs> or, you know, you have you have your your specific kind of like American history esque book Twitter that is in one group, and so it becomes very easy for groups to self segregate, be a part of their own thing, and then there's little to no coordination or action on anything that was particularly matters to them because you're already in your own little self regulating uh, assumption group and things like that. So 
on on one hand, it's very powerful for say those that control the algorithm or those that control um, how the messages get disseminated. I mean, it only, all it takes is one particular turn of phrase and everyone's using it the next day, like a, a light switch was turned on. So I, I think that in the long run, it's as if we've taken the evolutionary scale for how animals and beings and creatures react and you've accelerated it. You've turned the, the fast forward button permanently on. And so mm. for some people, they'll survive and adapt and do well. But for most people, I think that they won't survive this sort of like digital, you know, Anthropocene extinction level event for their mm. brains. So I, long term, probably positive for those that make it out like any evolutionary constraint or bottleneck. But uh, it will also be a negative, very obviously, for a lot of people. Yeah. And it's also exposed people to a lot of what I've seen, imitations of things in reality that uh, fool them into thinking that they have those things in real life. Just some classic examples would be uh, pornography, where you pretty much fool your brain into thinking you have a, a relationship and uh, that you don't need to go put yourself out there, go on dates, meet new people. Uh, another example would be community. I specifically, with something specific, I uh, witnessed that was very chilling was uh i can't remember exactly what the details were but i watched some type of online debate and the two guys were debating about how do we have an impact in the world and the one guy asks um in the debate what have you done this this year to serve your community and one of the fans in the chat said of the guy that was asked the question said he doesn't have to do anything in his physical community we are his community now and it just sent like a chill down my spine because i'm like no you're not you're not his physical community. He has a real community around him as well. You can have an online community. You can have people that you share ideas with, even online friendships. But you can't divorce yourself completely from the fact that you still, if you can uh, do something in your real community, you still should try. You can't just uh, use the excuse of, oh, I've got an online community. I don't, uh, I'm writing off the physical community around me, even if that's on a micro scale, like a family or your, your obligations and duties to your family and friends. Um, I think that's one of the big dangers of the internet. It, it has pretty much mass exposed so many people to so many imitation online Im and virtual imitations of things that you should be doing in real life. And it's fooling people into a false sense of complacency that they have those things. I am active in my community, my online community. I have, uh, I have a, a fulfilling relationship, an online fake parasocial relationship. All those little footnotes are the, the disturbing devil in the details. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, if you substitute, like you had mentioned with pornography, like if you pair, if you you know substitute the parasocial for a social, then your life is now completely you know you've centered your digital life as the center of all things in your life, and when you mm -hmm. do that, then all that that means for everyone else is is that well. Um, you know, the outside world doesn't matter as much. Things that are happening outside my window don't matter because for me, the only window that matters is the window to the digital world, uh, you know, that I see on my phone screen or my computer screen. And I've, I've kind of compared the internet to, um, you know, psychotropic drugs, uh, ayahuasca, especially where it is both this place that it's this drug that we consume, the digital, but it's also a platform that we can exist on. We have to take this drug in order to experience connections with otherworldly beings. I mean, if not for the Internet, right, I would have never have, met, you know, st talked to you or, or met you online and have had conversations both on the air or privately as friends. And so, like, on one hand, yeah, there's an absolute massive benefit to it. But I also know you know, that uh, my world outside of my window here in the middle of nowhere, Texas is a lot different than out there in South Africa, where things are clearly materially much worse than say where I met. And so you have to put those things into perspective. And I think that people can easily lose track of what physically tangibly matters to them, both in terms of like survival or politics or just their own social and spiritual health um, when they substitute everything for the digital. Hmm. Uh, Gio, some of your, th your thoughts on uh, what uh, Prudential said there and what I said earlier? I think, I think in a way, though, it, it's, I mean, it, the one sense, yes, it's, it's the healthy and correct opinion to say that, well, the screen is only a mediated form of reality in that um, we're sort of like, you know, we still have those like real tangible real world things. So 
in a way, yes, we have to touch grass, obviously. But in another sense, I think that that screen, that window, as much as it's sort of like a odd form of a, you know, alchemical or ritualistic magic in some ways, even like the black screen is, there's something very Gnostic to it, something very Manichaean to the way that identity is disseminated in the internet. I would still think though that the sort of, the modes by which we interact with people online, they do have a tendency to bleed out into the everyday. Mm. And there are a number of concerning elements to that. I mean, from what I hear, you know, now I'm, I'm in a weird position where I have certain, you know, not to say hello, fellow kids, but like I have certain <laughs> Zoomer tendencies as a, you know, core millennial. Um, but from what I can tell, a lot of Zoomers, they value sort of like the one, the one or two or three deeper interpersonal relationships. And then they have the sort of like online community thing. And it's, it's much less of the like millennial cult of normalcy around like touching grass and going to bush parties or whatever irony leftists that are in their like mid thirties like to tell people, but no, but, but then of course the right wing also has this version of like touch grass, which is like, well, not to subtweet certain posters we're trying to think of, but, but I think that when it comes to, when it comes down to it, the, the trends that are kind of disturbing would be the sort of um, the cavalierness towards ident like towards groups and towards our own like experience of like, ideology and interacting with other people on the internet and the way that internet trends that are like more hyper political tend to mediate into real life opinions and, and voting patterns and so forth. So for example, like to bring like a South African example, I remember there was this, uh, this was last year. It was the early year in the year. And it was like some tweet that went viral about like how South Africans who are, you know, Afrikaner, like, they moved to Perth, Australia oh, right. and how that's like uniquely evil. And so you have all these like, you know, post Tumblr, like zoomer MB kids with pronouns in the bio with the same, like, you know, pick crew avies talking about like, it's, just, it was just like such a form of normie sadism to talk about like how it's like evil, like, like the equivalent of like the way they were talking about South Africans that escaped the terror of the 1990s. It, they escaped to Perth is like they would talk the way that you would talk about, um, you know, certain Germans from a certain Austrian painter regime that went to Argentina in the forties. You know, it's like, that's the way they were talking about it. Like every single Afrikaans, you know, person that moved to Perth and, and from, you know, the 1990s onwards, they're like this uniquely evil, you know, they were directly responsible for putting, you know, Mandela in jail or something. I don't know. Oh, they so, shouldn't be relaxing on the beach. They should be on trial. Exactly. <laughs> it's like there should be like Nuremberg S trials for every South African that moved to like Perth or that even moved through to Canada. It's like, but, but I think like the reason I bring this up is because it was an online phenomenon that went like, I think some like huge leftoid Twitch streamer, it wasn't Hassan, it was someone else that had a tweet that was like 100,000 likes about like never ask. A South African, who, right. why did they move to Perth in the 90s? Right. Like, in other words, they should be punished for, like, you know, that they like. So, you're admitting that the trends were going downward in, in the ANC government, but it's like, you know, those people have to suffer because they have to stay in yeah. South Africa. Like, so it doesn't make any sense. But the way I bring it up is because there, there seems to be like the, the phenomenon of normie sadism, I think, is really I, amplified to an amazing degree by a lot of these internet trends. And this is a topic that we've been talking about forever, even back in like the blogger sphere days, even back in like the early internet where people were getting into online communities. But I noticed that like the, the phenomenon of normie sadism is been intensified, I think because of the amplifying element of the internet, the fact that you can post a video out of context on TikTok or Twitter, the fact that, you know, you can have trends and there's really like this hive mind phenomenon that goes on. And, and then like, let's face it, everyone, you know, nobody's immune to this. I mean, even like, you know, on the political right and the internet, you know, you, you have like certain tweets or certain videos, like everyone dog piles on them. But I do notice that like, um, there have been a number of key political events from the 2010s onwards that have done this. I mean, let's face it, the, the Rittenhouse trial is one of them. Uh, I even saw a tweet today. Everyone was dunking on, about like uh they still have this mythology over him like 
you know, doing it like he was like some kind of like, you know, whatever. But I think like there are like obviously manipulations going on as to why certain things are pushed. Right. Like there's there's a certain element of like the fabulation of the Internet that pushes certain political issues to like, uh, I would say, like such a a maniacal degree. Like there's a mania that goes into like political issues that like especially around race or religion or things of that nature. Um, there's like a mania around posting these videos and clips and people responding to them. Like it's, it's very fascinating the way it works. And then of course, eventually it does have real world political implications. Mm. I mean, the whole, like we went from the span in less than 10 years of like talking about like, I don't know, alternative pronouns on Tumblr to having the, uh, the Imperial flag and the middle centerpiece of the white house. And of course the, like the discourse around it by the, the political left has been like, Oh, it's just like a, you know, you're freaking out over a flag. It doesn't mean anything, but of course everything is political, but it doesn't mean. I remember when that flag yeah. was introduced a few years ago. I can't remember how long it was, but it was yeah. the first time it appeared and everyone was mocking it. Everyone was thinking like this. It can't be real. It has to be some type of joke, almost like the, the okay sign. It has to be some type of elaborate, uh, yeah. uh, 4chan op, but no, it's real. And now it's, now it's being flown by the most uh, powerful regime in the world. So, no, when people say, oh, well, Twitter isn't real life, I'm like, oh, well, it influences real life. It influences elections. That's undeniable. And the amount of censorship and the amount of propaganda you see on these and the amount of manipulation you see on these platforms proves that it influences reality. If it didn't influence reality, then uh, their propaganda would be unnecessary. Then they wouldn't need to uh, uh, influence and uh, manipulate these platforms so much. So, of course, the... The internet is increasingly becoming this cultural uh, battleground, but at the same time, it happened so fast. I mean, I remember yeah. specifically only 20, 2015, 2016, I remember the first like meme that bled into real life. It's, um, it's, not, it's not some weird niche thing. It's just a Rambo meme. I remember sitting in class in, in university yeah, and me and my mates were in on the inside joke. We knew what memes were. Nobody else does. We make a little reference and one guy in the class of 150 looks around at us and does this smile. And it was the weirdest thing, <laughs> like a connection with someone in real life. Like, you know what I'm talking, you know, the joke that we just made and you're yeah. laughing as well. It was the strange thing. Now today it's just, everyone knows. Now today it's just, everyone's in on the joke. Everyone is, uh, there's no type of that's why the, the the jokes get more meta and more meta because it, everyone's struggling it's it, it's in a inside joke arms race to just get just stay inside before everyone just gets in on the joke and then you have to completely abandon it and jump to the next one yeah i mean that's just sort of the the nature of how ubiquitous it's become everyone is kind of in on it and these little groups have to get more specific with their with their humor or but i mean also to a point where it's been really negative is is that uh, irony has just become so it's just everywhere now uh, everyone nowadays has that sort of there's no value to anything it's rather we've desacralized everything through irony so everyone's kind of in on the joke, but at the same time, you know, there's a real generational gap for those born before the internet, the pre-smartphone, pre-2007 social media era, and those born after it or who've only grown up in it. So, I mean, anyone born in like the year 2000 and onwards, especially in the West, is raised and sort of enculturated in this sort of irony of humor where we sort of desacralize everything to where you know, kids nowadays are like 17, 18, 19 years old. They can make humor about self-harm and suicide that even mm -hmm. for someone like me, who's like 10 years older, is just like, are you, are the kids all right? And obviously they aren't if they're making humor like this, but it really mm -hmm. is indicative of how quickly everyone's sort of been on in, in on the joke, but also how extreme can you take the joke to be? And I, it really does illustrate that to an extent that, also the world outside us outside of the digital has also gotten increasingly worse like it, it one doesn't have to go too far to sort of look at the basic conditions and everything from like life expectation to political polarization to inflation the cost of home goods and things like that to recognize that things are very much on the right on the wrong track 
and people will sort of idealize or self-identify um, with sort of the more nihilistic offshoot lone, you know, kind of characters, lone wolf style characters. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of that literally me style attitude that's in there. But I mean, it's also, I think, a real reflection of how bad things have gotten in the real world to where, yeah, like our cultural heroes for a lot of like Zoomers these days are these like nihilistic or sort of just like men that have to make the most of the worst situation possible rather than a hero type character of the 1950s. Like we've, we've traded out, you know, John Wayne for Ryan Gosling is the, pro is the prominent example of it. And I think that the internet is, uh, has done that way to where anyone can make a, a literally me joke and go from there. And um, I mean, on one hand, yeah, it's kind of universal. Everyone sort of gets it, but at the same time, there's such a generational gap that, uh, the writer and author James Polis makes a very good point in his book, Human Forever. Like the, the generation afterwards, these are the ones that are being algorithmically catechized into this sort of like global village culture of the internet. I think there's a reason why Ryan Gosling took over John Wayne. Like that, well, that's like a, that that's like a, uh, that's an academic, uh, that's a media studies paper in its own. I'm sure some oh, academic yeah. would probably do it, but I could do probably it way a better chapter in your academic. book as well. Maybe it could be. It could be. Um, but the literally I think, me chapter. Yeah, the literally me effect. Um, I think like what's interesting is that the literally me thing is with Ryan Gosling. There was this great Xanti tweet, and he recently got his account nuked for no reason because he, you know, unfortunately um, alluded to sunsetting in one tweet. Hopefully, he gets his account back. Uh, my good friend Xanti, I, I actually was one of the first people to interview him, uh, Mytho American. The biggest set. Of, he still has his account, Mytho American. Um, but he had this tweet about like Ryan Gosling. It's like, why do people love the characters? It's like, it's like oddly, it's like, you know, he's like somewhat nihilistic, self ref, uh, self deferential, um, you know, sacrificial. Like, there's something about the Ryan Gosling characters that I think, um, because you have to look at the way that media is propagated by the society that is around the sort of social gestalt of uh the media around it like you know a hero like john wayne comes about in the american post-war period uh the cold war was still going on there was still this like notion of american exceptionalism and this notion of like the frontier of america like conquering the sort of forces of evil very like i wouldn't say john wayne's one-dimensional but certainly a character like john wayne the cowboy phenomenon oh, is the one dimensionality in John Wayne. Oh I have, yeah. No. I have no problem saying that as someone who was raised up on all of those movies. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, at a certain yeah. point, he's like done three movies with the exact same plot of Rio Bravo. And it's just like, I don't really just <laughs> correct, I've done this movie before. And I mean, yeah, yeah I don't, I don't mean yeah. to interrupt there, but like, yeah, there is some one dimensionality too. Oh it. yeah. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, that's what I mean. Like, it's sort of like the, um, american mythos of like we're confronting evil and then like we have to like break the rules to confront that e oh god i said, I said the <laughs> term. um you know we have to bend the rules we have to go at them and like pro wrestling is like that by the way or at least it used to be nowadays it's like this postmodern mess of like nobody there's no heels there's no faces but anyways the point being is that ryan gosling though is sort of like the subject of like a uniquely modern times hero of someone who is sacrificial but has a little bit of the tism in terms of the detachment towards everything around him but then you know awakens into a deep concern on another level for what's happening around him uh you know like we we reviewed place beyond the pines that's a great example of that yeah. um whereas john wayne is very much within like he is the epic hero uh he's going to tame the wilderness it's like very much like, you know, that new American century type of thing. Not to say that John, like John Wayne is a sort of a culturally rightist figure, but there is like a little bit of like, not to say like there's an element of neoconservatism in there, but anyways, this is a huge distraction for the main topic of the stream. But I think that there's a reason why these figures become literally me. Uh, well, and, well, if yeah. you don't mind me jumping in there, Gio, I think that one of the, yeah, the the biggest things about that is, is the the differences of what we would conceive of space is. Oh, I mean, yeah. the, the, the Western is the most fundamentally sort of American form of media because it is explicitly only one country on earth that is like conquered this like vast unknown territory with, and I'm not even, I, I get it. There were other colonial efforts, but as a, as a country and as a culture, like 
from King Philip's War to fighting like the Plains Indians up until the the Westerns, like that was sort of the American culture was to dominate, take up physical space, manifest your destiny, and go on from there. Uh, that that space has been conquered, and that space it's is kind of yeah, and it's also very, but it's also done like right that that physically that space is conquered and territorialized, and we're re-territorializing other places culturally speaking to where you know it's a it's a great meme and a great myth that we tell ourselves that like mtv and blue jeans won the cold war mm. um and whereas <laughs> now it which again myth right but nowadays yeah. with that space conquered the only place that you do have to go is sort of like the deracinated person constantly trying to fight like this growing deterritorialization of modernity and so yeah like on the internet it's easy to identify with ryan gosling or christian bale i mean that's why there's it's why every character from like Travis Bickle to um, any character Ryan Gosling plays is identified by a lot of like, m you know, young millennial or even older millennial, but also Zoomer white guys that are just like, yeah, that's me because that's the way <laughs> yeah. I want to I, I want to I want to rebel against the modern world, right? Rage <laughs> against it, so to speak. Yeah. And the Internet gives you an opportunity to express this malaise and it does sort of become a, a lot of, of ryan gosling edits with spinning wheels in them yeah yes it's, yes yeah but but i think like that's why they like even uh i i feel like there is an outlet for the fact that like you can't have like a largely white epic hero anymore like the whole like the recent spider-man discourse around the zero hp lovecraft tweet like i mean i i know that even like in south africa they have like a huge uh, film industry and I've watched a few crime dramas and, and like some, like even in South Africa, I think in Australia, they have like the fascination with the cowboy as well. There's this, um, there, there's this one series with a, an Aboriginal uh, man. It's like sort of like a cowboy crime noir thing. It's pretty good from Australia, but, but so it's like universal type in some ways, but yeah, I mean, conf the sort of lone man confronting the staff, like that's, the imagine the cultural mm. imagination isn't there anymore. It has to be like a conquering of virtual space in some ways. Um, yeah. So I think like that's why the next uh, Ryan Gosling film, the Barbie film, will be <clears throat> kind of interesting to like integrate into that like largely <laughs> autistic white male template. Like you know, I guess maybe that will also reveal like something about the online because I, if I recall, like isn't the script about how they they realize that like Barbie world is sort of like a Plato's cave or something like that. It's not real. Like, basically, kind of, basically. Yeah. Greta yeah. Gerwig so there you go. telling you yeah. to, well, she's real and all that jazz. Yeah, it's well, now that you... Uh, because they needed more of a mid type. Of, well, I guess it's Barbie. They can't have like a total <laughs> mid girl. But anyways, go, go ahead. Yeah, but now that you mentioned the, the specific place of the Western within American culture, it's a little bit off the internet topic, but it will get back there, I reckon, because... I just immediately thought to myself growing up in South Africa, what is the what is the quintessential South African film? And well, it's film setting, I should rather say. And maybe some of my I know, I know a lot of uh, my audience are South African. So if you can say in the chat, maybe from longer, longer ago when the South African film industry was a bit more prominent in the culture. I mean, a lot of South African films are still coming out, but I think the cultural impact of South African films domestically has dwindled as they've just been completely shoved aside by uh, any film you want on demand from abroad. Um, now, when I think about South African films impact on the culture not just domestically but worldwide is i just think of south africa being the setting of like dystopian late literal setting of like dystopian films like dredge and chappie and uh, district nine where it's just <laughs> used as a film set oh, for, i mean there, there district really nine there's district nine in the chat uh before <laughs> i even made my points so, south africa has just become a film set for dystopia it's that's what I when I think about you when you met, brought up the idea of cultural impact of film in your I just think now about South Africa the cultural impact we have is as a film set a dystopian one. <laughs> I remember uh, there was a great sword cinema. I mean they've they're gone now. I think you have to access it through the Wayback Machine. Uh, they nuked the the account, but uh, the, there was a great sword cinema review of um, of of District Nine being like unintentionally based because it has like sort of like the white man's burden type of theme in it, but also like it did like a negative depiction of like South Africa as like this overrun dystopian hellhole. That's like, maybe that wasn't like the positive vision of South Africa with films that came out like after, you know, apartheid. It's like this weird, like 
I get what they were trying to do as a metaphor, but it just like reiterated like a not like a not like a not blue pilled interpretation of current South Africa. Um, but Ch- Chappie was also really uh, was interesting as well in that regard. Mm. Like it's sort of like they have to reveal it. Like the fact that like it's it's really odd how like they have to like they can't work around like the implications of like the running down of current South Africa. Like it's really funny that way. It's like like I said, yeah. the, the the big draw of South African films or films that utilize South Africa is the scenery, but the dystopian scenery. No longer the yeah. if people want to get African scenery, they usually go to like Kenya or Tanzania to film. Um, but South Africa yeah, specifically is for just that industry. just that hellscape. That I mean, Dredge is the best example. I know exactly the building where that movie was filmed. It's it's in Johannesburg. I've driven very close past it. Past it. You can uh, you can actually visit it to uh, to see what's going on there. But um and I just noticed in the in the chat we're talking about South African films. Everyone's just mentioning Neil Blomkamp films, just Ignite, Elysium, mm-hmm. uh, Chappie because they all do that thing. I mean, I actually do like uh, District 9 and I do you like the aesthetic of Blomkamp's films, the South Africa, but mo- most of me for the, the South Africa, the way he utilizes South African scenes and aesthetics. But what I find funny is now when you look, think about modern South African cinema, you just think about exactly that phenomenon what I, that I was talking about. South Africa as the scene, the dystopian scene. It's not that South African culture or the cultures that you find in South Africa really uh, feature prominently. And I see a sideline of opinions mentions uh, Leon Schuster comedies. Me and Prudentialists have actually talked in private about this. These, like, really over the top South African comedies that used to be made, but now the filmmaker has been cancelled because all those films he does in like he's impersonating every ethnicity and race in South Africa and he's fooling people. But uh, and everyone found it funny until one point when uh, people just said, "Now, uh, when South Africa was introduced to the concept of blackface, it didn't even exist here," and then he was just cancelled. But back in the day when his movies were premiering in cinemas his in most of the audience was just black people that went to watch it it's the f- strangest thing um but anyway yeah the, the films are on youtube you can go watch them if you want to see a glimpse into a different time of south african comedy jock fisher names a very good south african film Ilolipop. that's a very well it's a it's what it's it's a definitely one i would uh would recommend i haven't seen philosophant that's the other thing. South African cinema is dominated by Afrikaans movies as well, was for a long time. Today, uh, there are still Afrikaans movies coming out, but not as many. But anyway, let's get, get back to the topic of the internet. Now, specifically, now that we are actually we're discussing culture and what influences and drives culture today. And Gio, I wanted to ask you, from what you've seen on online and, and how it, and we've talked about how the internet seeps into reality. Has the internet become the primary staging ground and incubation chamber for culture in the modern world? Is has it changed from the internet impacting, uh, bleeding into reality to a, a stage where we are now, where reality and culture is just being in, formed online? It's no longer just a bleeding into reality effect. It's culture is being formed and created online. What's what's some of your thoughts on that? Oh, very much so. Yeah, I mean, there, there is, I, I think I said this before, I think it was, I was talking to someone, I think it was around the, um, was it a year ago that the, uh, the, the like, Will Smith slapped Chris Rock over mm. his, like, wife or something? I like, remember. it was like a year ago, it was like the, the award show. Like, I could remember early 2000s culture before the internet, like, really took off. And I could remember still having, like, the residual awareness of like the MTV world where celebrity dumb still largely determined um, what content was quote unquote. But nowadays, I mean, it's, it's pretty much almost guaranteed that most references, even in the most mainstream of annals of pop culture are pretty much have some inkling or some kind of uh, connection to internet or e-culture in, at least in some capacity. And, you know, in a lot of ways, um, even the way that content is created, like there was a time where like early YouTubers wanted to like replicate what Hollywood was doing, right? Like, and it's like they were going to become mainstream stars and some of them did a little bit, 
but then of course they faded away and now the like the modern um youtuber content creator is is much different in their approach by just admitting that like nowadays like the primary focus of most like younger people is largely on the internet so yeah i would say this that's true like the, the whole model of like how content is generated is different and of course like um we're really, you know, apparently the writer's strike is still going on, uh, but we really kicked it off was like the, the early, like the beginning, the first writer's strike, I think it was like 2011 or 2012. Um, and we're like, you had like these, like, you know, uncreative uh, Hollywood executives for these like talk shows, like rating early YouTube for content. And so you had like, you know, Numa Numa and Pruane Two Forever and, Brad and like all these other like dregs of like early YouTube. Now they're appearing on like the Jimmy Kimmel show or whatever. And so I think like nowadays, the reason that the writer strike isn't like so like, you know, hasn't had a huge effect on Hollywood is because the serialization of all media is largely because of the internet, because there's an infinity of content everywhere. You must continue producing. So that's right. like another, like the internet has expanded our like consumption of content, but also the way it's created in the sense that it has to never end. And when it does end, it's like this monumental thing or there's like this spinoff to everything. There's got to right. be like, you know, an awareness of the spinoff and like what, what, I don't know, like what, uh, like any, like the Marvel, like my, my, our good friend, Marty Phillips, the, you know, he had, his book came out recently. Uh, he had this great quote. Um, about this thing I'm writing about in my book, actually, about this this like AI programmer that wanted to see like the quote unquote background of these famous paintings, like the Mona Lisa. Wow. And you saw that, right? And so my, my our good friend Marty Phillips said that it's the marvelization of all culture. It's like, it's like yeah, that's, that's a universe. good painting, but what if big? <laughs> yeah. It's like, what if we made it big? Like nobody yeah. asked for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no but it's like the marvelization it's like we have to keep mm. continuing it's like it's like what did tony St i think the tweet that marty phillips posted like what did tony stark's cousin do like in in iron man and iron man 3 it's like it's it's gonna expand inf infinitely and because yeah. the nature of the internet's like that right like i go on your show you go on our show it's like Hmm. it's it never ends right yeah it's the it, i mean it's the the typical idea of the crossover is completely yeah what happens after the, the stream that's a good yeah. <laughs> crystal <what happens laughs> <after the> stream? <laughs> so crystal smith says any film that has a cusper in it deserves an oscar well the, absolutely mm -hmm. so a cusper is like this uh old era uh, bush war era military vehicle that's not just used for riot control today but it's like an anti-ambush uh, anti-mine vehicle it actually looks pretty pretty cool so absolutely but yeah uh prudentialist what are some of your uh, your thoughts there on what on specifically that question as well where's culture being formed uh, today and how quickly it changed from just in our living memory as gen z uh, up until today well i would say that it's certainly been a wild ride from say like uh, what geo mentioned say like the first writer strike was actually even earlier like 2007 2008 um and you had a weird attempt to have like modern celebrity dumb where things were still access hollywood interest in the you know celebrity gossip and intrigue to where you know fred got a movie made he's like one of the earliest youtube channels to hit like a large milestone of a few hundred i think like a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand or something like that you know they had weezer make an appearance on his like youtube channel and videos like that this weird little world of some high-pitched you know voice kid or whatever <laughs> right like and so a lot of that's changed where now there are, are hundreds of thousands of people that tune in to people that just sit on their desk and talk while playing video games all day and are expected to have like well fully fleshed out formed opinions on things i mean i i don't consider like you know i wouldn't go to someone like asmund gold for like you know detailed <laughs> analysis on today's political opinions but like that man has hundreds of thousands of people that follow me has contracts with i think like blizzard entertainment or whatever and was recently a part of uh, summer games fest to talk about like what's going on in respects to upcoming games news and things like that and it just sort of indicates that culture is very bifurcated like you can be a part of what you could call like the pre-digital or like the old world where you're more interested in say like the royal family or you're more interested mm. in things that are going down locally but then there's this whole other world where people 
or have this odd fascination with these sort of parasocial cults of personality. And that happened very quickly. Um, and I mean, Gio and I have covered uh, this essay called Pandora's Vox by a woman named uh, Hum, or her handle was Humdog on the internet. And she sort of just talked about how everyone sort of turned into their own mode of, um, you know, culture production and capital where like you have to be this item that constantly has to produce drama and constantly has to point the mm. sign at yourself saying the well, drama is the content. Yeah, it oh, yeah. is. Absolutely. I mean, uh, how, and we, we joke about this on our show all the time where it's just like, you know, and there's a whole chunk of what we talk about, at least at least half an hour about what on earth the, the quote unquote discourse is from from Twitter, because the things on Twitter will inevitably become the news chirons of that same day or, or tomorrow. I mean, um, our, 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 our mutual of ours, his name is uh, at Mog the Urbanite. Uh, he goes by Enoch Powell on the Internet. He made a great meme format about Tucker Carlson's recent little Twitter bits uh, where he does his 10 minute monologues on, on Twitter now. And he made a meme about it. And it was a very popular meme format for like a couple of days to a point where the same day that that meme format got popular, the conservative news outlet, The Daily Caller, did a little short article about it. And it was it was indicative of the fact of how quickly things can move to where, you know, today's tweets are today's news headlines, which then become the talking point for the week. And then we move on to the next thing. Um, and I find in a way... Um, you know, this French, he's sort of a socialist Marxist character, but like, you know, Guy Debord's society of, uh, society of Spectacle, where all these new spectacles kind of keep us distracted from the real problems. It does a really good job at that, I think, to a lot of extent. There's a lot of truth in what he had wrote. You know, that was like 200 years ago. And now we're looking at the world today and, oh, all of a sudden a new headline pops up and we have to react to it. We have to respond to it. I mean, you know, what, uh, 90 days ago, right, a month and a half ago, two, three months ago, we had the, uh, in America, you had the East Palestine train derailment, and almost no one mm. talks about that. We had someone yeah. uh, with my organization, like the Old Glory Club, you know, actually go back to East Palestine, do some reporting, do some water testing, and tell you, well, this is what's happened in the months that's passed. And no one nowadays has that sort of... Um, you know, mentality or that arc of history in their brain, we've totally spazzed out our attention spans to where it's all incredibly shortened. I mean, I, the internet moves things and ages so rapidly. Uh, this is a, a, an awful example, but it, it's one that I experienced where on my YouTube recommendation feed, Sargon of Akkad's like VidCon 2017 <laughs> video classic. review. Classic, right? <laughs> it has the Ben Garrison cartoon where Anita Sarkeesian's calling him a, a trash human being. And I oh, looked boy. at that and I thought to myself, this is a million years old. This yeah. is, you know, this is age. This is a this fossil. garbage human. Uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> I'm like, I'm an archaeologist finding this like rare artifact again. I'm like, oh, this is like finding the Rosetta Stone of or of how <laughs> yeah. all things originated on this like internet space. And right. It's just like, but it's, but it's, you know, have... it's 2017. It's a few, it's what, six years old now. And it's just like, oh, wow. I feel like you had to do almost old. like some internet archaeology to find it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have two controversial takes. Um, <laughs> the East Palestine thing is interesting. I think that if 9-11 were to have happened in 2021 instead of 2001, uh, I remember that. I remember for at least six months, that's all people could talk about. It's the classic uh, Zuma question. I mean, it's almost become a meme in itself. Of like, uh, you, uh, you, remember you, you can't really be a you can't yeah. be a Zuma generation if you can't remember distinctly uh, that happening. Yeah. I'm here's a South African. I remember it. I was uh, sorry to interrupt you, Gia. Oh, just a ahead. quick thought there. I remember. So we didn't have cable uh, uh, television. We just had like the state, uh, the the South African state channels, so, uh, South African Broadcasting Commission uh, of. Uh, uh one two and three and uh, every day at like five o'clock there was like a cartoon that played and then nothing and then it's just boring uh shows for if you're a child i just remember specifically every channel the three that we had uh was just filled with images of these burning tires and i had no idea what was going on i was just uh I was just pissed because I, I couldn't see uh, Ash Ketchum become the Pokemon master in this uh, today. <laughs> and uh, everyone, oh. everyone, all the adults are super concerned. Everyone is like pale faced and freaking out. 
and I'm not old enough to really understand the the implications of what's going on, why every channel just has the same footage of these burning build buildings on, and that that's that's all I remember. Man, even South Africa, holy crap! Yeah, that's because here in Canada, it was like we were Americans too, almost. It was like a unique, you know. Um, but what I was gonna say is, I think if it would happen in 2021. I, I swear to God, I think that people would forget, not forget, but they would, the, the importance of it would wane after a month, not even, um, it, because there will be something else. Uh, I don't, maybe that wouldn't be exactly true, but I think it would be much less severe in terms of its impact towards like pop, the popular sort of um, collective zeitgeist if it was in 2021 instead of 2001. Because 2001, the internet was just sort of like taking off as a mass phenomenon. Um, but nowadays, I don't know. I mean, prove that could be a controversial take. The other controversial take I had would be, um, you mentioned drama is the content. I'm going to give a shout out to my uh, mutual on Twitter. His name is Heist Griper. And I, I probably shouldn't mention this because, I mean, you know, he's affiliated with people. Uh, but, you know, like Ethan Ralph, right? You know, Ethan Ralph? Yeah. Kill stream. Mm -hmm. Um, there's this tweet that High Scraper did where it's funny how like he said that Ethan Ralph is sort of like a uh, Soviet, the closest to a Soviet commissar in terms of like creating an ecosystem of what the, the trolls, the A logs that like constantly report on drama. And like there's this little ecosystem of like people that comment on Ethan Ralph drama. And it's like this really weird phenomenon because Christian had that as well, right? Like Christian's even bigger example of like, there are people that have sustained their careers off of commenting on, on the, the machinations of a uh, Christine Weston Chandler. So it's like this weird thing where like drama sustains an ecosystem of people that are surviving off of the super chats of commenting on drama of this one specific lol cow. And of course, CWC is the biggest example. Like, I mean, I mean, the Kiwi Farms thing, that wouldn't have happened unless Null was like the first uh, channelogist, right? So it's like this, I, I was just reminded of that, how drama is the content. Drama can create an ecosystem of content that can sustain people. So uh, I, I don't know, maybe that's, that's sort of, that's gotta, that's gotta be some kind of like Soviet Lysenkoist uh, <laughs> creation of worth through nothing, right? So yeah, like, but I mean, that's yeah. exactly why uh, I invited you to, to discuss this topic, because in a sense, this theme very broadly uh, is a, is a big influence on, on what you discuss on your podcast as well. You're not a, like I said, you're not a drama channel, but a lot of what's happening around you online, you are taking it a bit further than just reporting on it you are well people don't tune in to see what's going to get reporting they see they want to have some meta analysis they want some what's going on behind the scenes what's really what are we witnessing here how does this fit into the bigger picture and um, i think that's where uh, a lot of your your longer uh, your longer rants geo get it get quite interesting specifically uh -huh. as you take something very mundane something uh, some internet phenomenon that uh, most people didn't even notice and uh, you go very deeply into it but it's at the end of your rant you can't help but think but yeah no but he's got a point though like it's not yeah, just some true. it's not just some consumer product that you're creating what you're talking about with the the drama content is just a purely consumer product it's just you're just creating like some some entertainment product but your analysis is still it's sincere it's not just entertainment that you're creating you actually want to get to the bottom of what's going on you're actually exploring right. uh the internet age that we're living in and like i said earlier or well, I, I referenced the idea of internet archaeology but i think that's going to going to become more and more a popular genre of content people just going not even far back when you think about archaeology you think about going back hundreds or even thousands of years in history internet archaeology is going to entail going back five years or three years to go find like some classic clip that has been lost to time it was deleted from the original source but someone saved it in some weird messed up format so you restore it using ai and then you present it to the world like a dinosaur fossil that you found <laughs> yeah that's that could happen no it's it's true like there are some things like you just remember like clips or videos that you saw and now there's this whole genre on youtube of internet archaeology as well where um people are trying to find like forgotten media like um mm. speaking of 9 11 there was actually this this video by one of these like next it wasn't next pose like when it was like scare theater or someone else of that genre where it was like forgotten media 
And they were talking about, and this video has like 3 million views, by the way. It was about like, the one segment was about this 9-11 video. Um, and I remember seeing it on 4chan back in the day. It was called Lull Superman, where it was about the, the jumpers, right? And people like breaking their brains on Reddit to like find this like video. But then when you like think of the implications, it's like you're trying to find a grainy early 2000s video of people meeting a harrowing end. And it's like this, and it becomes an internet phenomenon. And, and it's like this lurid fascination with like the fact that it becomes forgotten media. Uh, but anyways, Prude, I wanted to get your take on the, the 9-11 controversial t- take I had there. I don't, uh, I don't know. In part because I think like a lot of catastrophe, I think actually I, I'm inclined to agree with your take actually, only for the sole purpose of the fact that you know, regardless of what we just experienced over the course of the last three years with uh, whatever came out of Wuhan's Institute of Virology, um, you know, quite a few hundred thousand people died. I, I don't know what the exact number is. I, I think it did top a million pe- over a million people. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the exact number is off the top of my head. But like millions, if not, you know, if a million, if not millions more died. And it raises like a weird question that we don't treat that with any substantial significance. It's just nothing more than like a partisan talking point where like, I know people who could not see their loved ones like die in the hospital or anything like that. Like I, yeah. or even me, like I had, I was in the hospital many times throughout 2020 cause I was dealing with kidney failure. And it's just like, I didn't see family very often because of all these restrictions. And it's like, well, if I'm dead, right. Like I'm dying alone in a hospital bed or something like that. It's not a fun thing to consider. And nowadays it's just viewed as a, a political partisan talking point. And it's very strange to see that like the very it's like first, a footnote. Yeah. It's a footnote in history. And I, I imagine that if nine 11 were to happen today or any time in this like Twitter era, um, there'd be little dark age edits it's the same day that it's happened. And I, I don't know. I, I'm not, I don't think that's a controversial take. I mean, I, people still make memes about it now. It's sort of this uh, humorous bit there. I mean, yeah. there's uh, someone did a review of one of those like newest Disney films going red by ER. And he ends the, he ends the, he ends his video with a nine 11 joke. Um, and it's just like, you know, nearly 3000 people died in this like attack on the, on us soil. And it's just like, yeah, we've, we've trivialized it in the same way that people can trivialize any other historical, uh, mass tragedy or, or fact of war. So I actually don't think it's all that yeah. controversial, mm. especially nowadays, but uh, even like, go ahead. even like the term, like of the video that was posted on 4chan, the title being lull Superman, like that's like a level of indifference and callousness mm. that you can't eat. but of course it's chan culture but, but i mean really we, but we it, see yeah. that but i mean it doesn't i i think you're right i think for people who aren't maybe on that part of the internet or weren't exposed to the infamous live leak logo in front of a construction set or uh clips of unspeakable violence by mexican drug cartels or things or the syrian civil war like if you're not yeah. actively seeking out for that which i think is some sort of like just thirst for not annihilation to, but like this thirst for like more desensitizing imagery. Mm. Like I want to imbue myself and enculturate myself with like the worst of the worst. Like you can go on YouTube right now and look up GoPro footage of Syrian rebels and Syrian like troops or whatever, killing each other in the sand. Well, you can find it for the, for the Ukraine war as well. Yeah, you can. And and it's not even, it's not even like you. A lot of people, I think, are under this impression that you have to go like on the dark web to find these types of no, things. Go like, on no, go on mainstream sites. Yeah, like go, not even go, Telegram. You, you can go find on, on Twitter. Twitter. Like I saw on the other day, like on my feed. So I'm, I'm, I don't see these things out. So it did disturb me. Like uh, someone, I don't fo- follow any accounts that really post disturbing stuff. But I can't remember who. Someone retweeted just a clip of a Ukrainian soldier that had the entire bottom of his jaw just shut off. Uh, shot off and then my power goes off but uh we're still that was good, pretty uh, dramatic but... <laughs> how at that moment it went on. maybe maybe the the the, no, the uh, nato it, was, it, was it, trying to get you or it was, it was uh, it was it was definitely a, a nice little coincidence there but yeah no I, i'm still fine even though i'm in the middle of a rolling blackout um but anyway as i was saying just to conclude um it was just a clip of like a ukrainian soldier lying on the ground like with his entire bottom of his face shot off and that's just there on a mainstream platform and it's been retweeted like a thousand times and all the comments yeah. are just people laughing and mocking it. 
my good friend Gordon from the War Report, um, the War Report podcast, he's like, you know, the thing is, um, you could go on Telegram and you could follow about less than five Telegram channels before you get something to like to see, like, I don't know, the um the Azov crucifixion video from like 20. This is horrible stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's like it's and and you know, that's what I mean. Even like this war has proven that in the absence of live, well, I mean, live leak is still around. It's on Telegram, by the way. Yeah. Um, in the absence of like the mainstream fascination with like, I, I was responding to this one very high IQ poster. Um, we were talking about this on, tw- I think his name is, um, is Garakol on Twitter or something. Um, he, we were talking about like the absence of gore posting. Like there used to be sites like best gore. Of course, the very first one was rotten.com that got yeah. into all sorts of legal issues. There's a whole like, huge history on rotten.com uh but you know there was like live leaks and best gore and uh, plenty of meat and stuff like that and of course you not to say i used to frequent these sites back in the day but um you know here in canada the luca magnata thing happened on best gore uh, but the you know nowadays we it, it just becomes in some ways it has to lift off from its like early internet mythos of like you know when you're a kid you see the shock site that your friend sends you, your friend sends you meatspin.com or whatever, or whatever, like gory shock site, right? Nowadays, it's like mainstream um, political discourse. It's like, go to, you could see the Ukrainian war. You could see like some, some, you know, Ukrainian or Russian dying in a trench and like having, having a grenade dropped on them by a, by a drone with like, no, that's the know, other thing is, all the, footage, I mean, yeah. cause I see a, uh, someone in the chat said, uh, it's, it's ogre. Yeah, no, it's everyone, yeah. everyone on both sides. Everyone is just fucking, looking at war wars become a spectator sport but like a, yeah. a messed up spectator sport where it's just people sharing clips of like i was talking to one of my mates the other day about it where no matter the who's uh piloting the drone and who's there on the ground but you just see these clips of like a drone dropping a, a grenade into like a foxhole and you see some 19 year old guy in there and he's struggling to get out and he's not fast enough it explodes blows off his leg yeah, and he's like lying there drone screaming. Just beaming into yeah the and he's just yeah. like screaming there for his whatever like his mother or his, or his wife and you're just thinking that is someone's husband that is someone's son that's someone's brother where he be whether he be a ukrainian or a russian you're just and he's dying there on a clip blasting like dubstep music in the background celebrating his, his suffering it's it's really debasing stuff that we're seeing happen. Like I said, it's it's happening from all sides. You see the same with uh, the whole uh, vaccine discourse as well. But I'm not going to get into too much there without uh, jeopardizing my channel. But you see it from yeah. both sides: people celebrating just death and destruction, and people suffering from. Well, this go- this goes back to your original question that you asked both of us: the negative or the positive in the long term. Yeah. I mean, in what less than. 15 years we went from emails where you know you'd get a scary like jump scare or a peaceful drive that old style <laughs> YouTube oh, car right <laughs> right it's an instant classic for anyone above a certain age where it's a car driving down then you yeah. just get spooked in the last like half second <laughs> it's and, like a zombie yeah right and then all, know, but, but what are we in uh, in that time that would scare the crap out of anybody and then you know it's 2023 and there are people discoursing about a guy that is making the sign of the cross before he gets no. blown up by artillery or a drone strike that he can look up and acknowledge that this is happening to him no. and recognize that his end is about to happen. And so we've become so utterly desensitized that like spooky girl from the ring appears in my email <laughs> or whatever <laughs> to where now we don't care if hundreds mm. of thousands of people are dying. Um, right before our, our very mm. eyes and we can we can comment in and mock it and things like that i mean i think that's a big part of the of the widespread negative because for most people especially in the west where they're not uh, prone to such acts of violence or warfare yeah it becomes really easy to sort of poke fun and laugh at that or to um you know get on your high horse and start um preaching or whatever about you know subways or diversity or whatever and then you know, actually, no, those are real people. And then these are things that are actually mm. really harmful. And instead, what we're going to do is make a mockery of what, what's happening there. And so, I mean, like, these are things that we're, we're totally cognizant of when Gio and I talk about these things, because it's just like, yeah, like, we're really witnessing the greatest period of dehumanization, um, at least in modern mm. times. I mean, like, because we're not, I mean, for most of the world, we're not in war, right? You know, like, this isn't, 
World War II where there's a battlefront in like every single part of the continent. There isn't something like that happening. And so now everyone has to live their own lives, but at the same time, I was like cognizantly aware of the fact that their ability to dehumanize the other person gets incredibly easy. And the mainstream media, of course, has got no problem uh, jumping on on this. I mean, there was an article, I think it was in like The Nation, talking about the need to like take out like suburban fascists in America and how they need to have their lives societally reorganized. And it just is indicative of the fact that like, yeah, like internet discourse, which allows dehumanization, gives like media agents the ability to talk about it which platforms it, which mainstreams it, which means that if any kind of action like that were to be done, um, a lot more people would have no problem watching uh, their grilling Sunday cookout neighborhood friends get rounded up or whatever, right? Like that's the kind of negative space that we're in. Hmm. I just see I wanted to highlight this comment here from uh, Colonel Chris Wyatt. Nice to see you're uh, your tuning in. Uh, he says, uh, war is not a spectator sport to those of us who have experienced it multiple times. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly what uh, we're talking about. The fact that it has become the, just this, you're, you're so far removed from it that you can watch it. Like a, many people do watch it like a spectator sport and actually seek out uh, that type of footage and that type of uh, experience. Um, but yeah, gents, to, uh, I think... As we wrap up here, um, I know your podcast is longer, uh, but like I said, I am on battery power here now, seeing as uh, I am experiencing the the real life, <laughs> the real life uh, hard times experience of uh, rolling blackouts. So the the last topic that I wanted to, or the last question that I wanted uh, to ask you before we wrap up completely, is specifically when it comes to the internet and its influence. Is there a way, you mentioned it now, Prude, you mentioned that we're in this loop, we've entered this content loop where atrocity or news event, big scandal or drama happens, people react to it, then it gets old, it gets thrown away, uh, uh, pushed aside, and it gets replaced by the new current thing. Even sometimes something, it doesn't even have to be current thing, it can be just be a news event, not all news events become current thing. But is the how long is the cycle? Or I mean, we can only speculate. But are we now trapped in this hyperloop of information, reaction, next information? It's almost like that uh, that meme of a uh, 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 consume product and then get excited for next product. Like consume draw internet drama and consume news event and then get get excited for next news event. Is it is this something that we can realistically see an end to, or is this something that could potentially trap humanity for a very long time in? Uh, the state of just internet and information consumption? I think it'll trap most people. I I don't know if there is a way out yet. I think that there are a lot of people that are finding or focusing on ways to break out of it. Um, I, for instance, I uninstall my my Twitter app from my phone every weekend um, to sort of be off of it less. I barely tweet during the weekends for this explicit purpose because I'm just not tuned in. Um, I didn't have it installed during Lent. I, I sh- I'll probably do that again and just be totally off of it for 40 days because I, I, I was more productive. I, I got more writing done. I got more reading done when I wasn't installed and I wasn't uh, you know wired in or plugged in. But I think for most people, it's just a central part of their lives. I mean, I if you have a smartphone, right, you can be contacted by your boss, your employer at any point in time. And you can be plugged into drama and people can call you telling you about what's up at any point in time. And so I think for a lot of people, yeah, you're we're stuck with it for quite a lengthy period of time, especially in the West where it sort of originated in Silicon Valley and out of the sort of DARPA defense contract for how to survive nuclear war. And so I, I think that we're stuck with it for a lengthy period of time. I think that if you want to have a healthy balance between your your real life and the digital life, you do need to ensure that you don't substitute the digital for the real. I tell people all the time that when you turn your phone off at night, do you like the face that is shown in the reflection of your phone screen? And if you don't, then that's a sign that maybe you need to work on something. But for, for now, I think we are stuck with it. And I do think that there are a lot of people of all sorts of different backgrounds, of all sorts of different um you know, politics, cultures, creeds, et cetera, that are all looking for answers. But I also think that what will shake us out of it for the time being is just our our decadent comfort in the West, especially like, yeah, it's nice to be tuned in on, on Twitter drama. But if all of a sudden 
you know, I living in the United States begin to experiencing, you know, rolling blackouts like you do in South Africa, I may not be as concerned about, you know, who said what on Twitter, right? Like, until the material conditions worsen, I, I think that Americans especially will be sort of stuck in this in this cycle. But um, I, I do hope and I, I personally work on it myself to find ways to keep a healthy balance. But I do think that we've moved from a 24 hour news cycle to like every millisecond cycle where everything happens at all times. And it always is on a refresh rate faster than I think our brains can recognize. But um, those are just some of my thoughts. And uh, I, I don't mean to end it on such a sort of dour note, mm -hmm. but I, I do see that being the case for us for the foreseeable future. Mm. Gio, are we, are we trapped? Are we uh, plugged in and there, there's no way out or what? Uh... What do you see for the future when it comes to specifically this phenomenon that uh, Prudentialist has been describing of uh, the just constant and ever accelerating news cycle uh, with a ferocious appetite just for new content, new drama, new global events and new current thing that people can consume and react to and uh, find almost a pseudo meaning in? Well, I think like um, to... In, in some ways to reverberate my point of being in the show, I think that it, it's a reality regardless. It's sort of like um, a way you analyze, uh, you know, power or will, let's say in uh, will to Nietzsche or power to Foucault to answer, to like ask, you know, what's outside of it or how can we like get rid of it? It's sort of like beyond the, uh, the actual scope of like the analysis. It's like saying, can we stop breathing and still live? It's sort of like, I think that's what the internet has become. I think that it has managed to ingrain itself upon the human psyche and upon everyday life and upon something probably deeper within us that we will experience a deepening of its effects and machinations, whether we want it or not. And so I think that there, there probably will be people that will live on sort of like nature preserves or whatever. It'll be sort of like a, um, uh, like a... <laughs> Like that movie, The Village, there'll be people that will have a, they'll create a mythology around like not uh, going into the, like they'll sort of live off the grid and they'll have like a mythos around like what people are doing in the outside world. It will sort of be like, you know, Jim Jones saying that like the, the cat evil capitalist Americans are going to uh, come and invade us anytime soon. That's when we need like a, a white knight, but for real. You know, if you know like the what the white knight was it was like the flavor aid right um he's like why can't we go to the soviet union it's like no even the soviet union they're not going to take us it's all over and so i feel like maybe there will be some like schizo people that will you know take the tech kaczynski pill but i think that there, most people will sort of like have to um sort of ride the tiger if you will but one one positive note i feel would be that the internet really does reveal the sausage being made in terms of like ideology and in terms of um, in terms of like just communities, right? Like there, there's no more a sort of like mystique around things that are told by to us that we have to follow or we have to like sort of mystify. Like for example, recently, uh, speaking of war, um, it was in like everyone's going nuts over like the White House thing and the the pride flag. There was this uh, response that got like a hundred thousand likes to a Ben Shapiro tweet. And um, not to say like, you know, people responding to Ben Shapiro. I, uh, you know, I know um, our friend Pete Quinones replied to Ben Shapiro with a certain other flag. He's like, do you pledge loyalty to this one? But besides the point, it was someone that posted a photo of this grave marker from a soldier Um that died of the sallow forums disease in the eighties, you know, talk about another public health crisis the, the the headstone said, I was, you know, I was praised by my government for killing two people in Vietnam and I was kicked out of the military for loving another person or some like kitschy phrase. But the point being is that like, um, there were a bunch of replies by other leftists that were quite revealing who were younger. Right. So it's like the message of the tweet, was this sort of like boomer lib patriotism where it's like, you know, the military industrial complex, it's good because it's gay now, right? Like it's like the, the, the soldiers of the rainbow flag. It's like very boomer liberal because they still have this like 
Cold War nostalgia of like American exceptionalism and American Jingoist. You know, we have to now, of course, we have to fight Russia because, but now Russia is no longer communist. They're like fascist now. So it's like the older boomer liberal version of the ideology. But then you have these younger people that are coming in with like the Palestinian flag and like the pronouns and, and the Pikru Avis. We're like, no, just because the imperialist is gay doesn't make him less of an imperialist. And so it's like this, you really get to see the sausage of leftist ideology being made in real time of like their own like in-group discourse and squabble. Whereas before it's like you never would be treated to that view, right? So it's very funny how a lot of the internet like creates a field of ideological battle, even like, even if it's a civil war, it's like, you know, we have to body that like older boomer, like state ideology that, you know, Joe Biden very much represents of like, basically pride flag version of like American militarism. It's like, no, they're still imperialists, even if they're gay. So it's like, you know, so I think like that is a positive effect in the internet because now you could like see in real time the way that the social discourse is going to go. So um, I don't know, like maybe, uh, maybe this is like the last hurrah of like, you know, Colonel, like General Milley, uh, you know, g- gay American, GAE American imperialism. Now it's going to be like this greater critique on the political left. And of course the right wing litigates things in public all the time as well, but that's a different issue. Um, mm. Yeah. I just, I thought of that. I saw this today. I had to rant on it and uh, prove <laughs> what, what do you two think of uh, like boomer liberal patriotism ver- sorry, patriot- <laughs> versus uh, like this newer, like hip zoomer, mb kid like you know palestinian rights now you're an imperialist you're a settler sort of thing of course the south africa thing plays into it as well so you know prude if you uh, have a final thought there you're you're welcome to share after that uh going to have to wrap up seeing as i'm a, a bit power constrained at the moment due to uh, sure uh, the, i'll, the, the I'll simply here. say but don't, is, uh, don't feel rushed i still got uh i think about five or eight minutes uh all, all i'll say geo is, is that i i think that you're going to see a clash of um progressive and liberal mythologies play out in the United States as things get more and more, uh, as more and more things change both demographically and politically, but we can hash this out on Thursday to say, yeah, uh, let's talk about our, our, our friend open. and some time. So, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So by all means, you can take us away. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us. I see yeah. Colonel Chris Wyatt says, stop uh, attacking America. We will poison your maple trees with <laughs> acid Implying that Canada is different than America. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for joining me, guys. I want to give you the opportunity. Who's going to do the honors of uh, shilling your content so people know where they can find you before we say goodbye? Well, it's on your channel, Gio, this week, so take it away. Yeah, where can my people channel, find your content? Jenner Productions at YouTube. Uh, that's also my Telegram channel. Please go to my Telegram. Everyone knows me from Twitter, Giant Gio. And now this week we're going to talk about uh, our, our, you know, the passing of Ted Kaczynski and his influence in his work. Uh, I think we'll, we're going to cover technological slavery or what essay we're going to cover. Prudent. We'll, we'll cover a few essays of his, some of his shorter ones. So people yeah. know more than just the, uh, the memes about industrial society and its consequences. Uh, but the digital archipelago is hosted on both geos channel and mine. We go back right. and forth between his channel and mine every Thursday at two fifteen PM Eastern uh, standard time. We both have our own respective works. You can find all of our links at findmyfriends.net. Just find giant art productions or the potentialist. And you can see all that we're doing. We're on Twitter. There's links YouTube. to that in the description for everyone too lazy to type or uh, that yeah. uh, don't want to go search for it. So that's uh, that's no problem at all. But yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for the insightful conversation. I wish we could go longer. There's still so much to we've only scratched the surface of uh, what there is to discuss on this topic. But uh, you can uh, check his uh, your channel out for uh, any of that type of content. This is the type of themes that you discuss, uh, specifically the internet and what's going on. Um, anyway, guys, thank you for tuning in. Thank you to the live audience as well. Thank you for your comments and questions. And then also... Thank you for uh, sharing this content. Thank you for letting everyone know when it's live. Uh, I know I will sometimes forget to do that. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I'll check you again next week. Uh, same time, same place. Uh, Tuesdays at 7. And uh, like I said, uh, cheers, guys. Have a good one. Thank you. And God, God bless. bless.